no single country, no single nationality, Kurds, Palestinians, Turks in Iran, Turkmenians in Iraq, will be able to get anywhere if they try and limit the, the horizon of their views about a level of independence, not just from the states that are currently repressing them, but from the presence of the US and Israel and the state of the region, if they want to liberate themselves from that, a coalition of the a united effort by these nationalities is necessary. Het is vandaag zondag 30 september en dit is Linkse Hobby's podcast van Authentiek Links. Vandaag hebben we een interview met Jasmine Matter. Als Senior Research uh, Computing Specialist verbonden aan de University of Oxford en waarnemend redacteur van de voor socialisten toonaangevende publicatie Kritiek. We spreken haar uitgebreid over haar politieke achtergrond als Marxist en haar geboorteland Iran. Zij heeft veel geschreven over Iran en de conflicten in het Midden-Oosten en zij neemt ons mee op een rondgang in de regio. My experience as a child, as a teenager, was very different from the lives of the majority of the population in my country. Um, this was in particular in the countryside when I became aware of how people were um, not just much poorer, but they, they had different customs, different, they were a- actually Muslims <laughs> as opposed to my family who were very secular and so on. And that really showed me that there was a considerable distance between ordinary people in Iran. Mm-hmm. Um, land reform had already happened, but second land reform by the Shah, but it hadn't made any difference, you know, it was no. And um, I became interested in politics. My family were political of various types, but mainly right wing. So political discussions were always in our house, but it's only then that I started looking for Marxist literature and mm. left wing literature. And that made me become a Marxist, if you like. Uh, at the time, I wasn't even sure. I was just uh, looking for egalitarianism and equality. And then um, a, a school friend whose father was a communist gave me a book. And so I started reading the, I started getting interested in reading Marx and, and so on. Um, I then later on became involved with the organization called the Organization of Iranian People's Pedalian Guerrillas. <laughs> Before, the, uh, after they split from the sections that supported Khomeini, and that's my political background, if you like. Before coming to um, Britain, um, and then, well, during that time, some of it I was in Britain as a student, but I went back and then came back, and. Um, I've since worked with um, various attempts of the Iranian left to unite, um, in addition to working for as, as a political thing for Critique, the journal Critique. Uh, all right, uh, thanks for that uh, elaboration. So people can at least place uh, you, of course. Um, so currently. Uh, there are, uh, f- from a bird's eye view of Iranian society, uh, there are lots, lots of things going on uh, uh, in Iran. Um, so for someone who doesn't quite know what is happening inside Iran, um, what are the main contradictions in the ruling elite of uh, Iranian society? Okay. Uh, the is official party in Iran, from the revolution is one. It's the Islamic Revolution Party. But it has many, many factions. There are two quite clear streams. One is the reformist, so if you like, Khatami, Rouhani, the former ex-president before Ahmadinejad. Mm -hmm. There's Khatami, Rouhani. Um, They are uh, associated with um, liberal capitalism, but they also have a slightly, and I emphasize slightly more liberal attitude to social and religious issues. For example, they are not so concerned about the interference of the state in the daily lives of ordinary people. They're more concerned about state and affairs of the state. And then we have the more conservative faction, 
some of them based amongst the uh, older uh, generation of clerics, senior clerics, ayatollahs in maybe Rome, in Tehran, in Isfahan, and they are much more hardline on um, Sharia law, on Islamic tradition, on maintaining Islamic tradition. And within those two trends, you have to say that there are many, many different lines. So it's not simply those true. It's true to say there are, I don't know, half a dozen, maybe dozen of trends within that. Amongst the reformists, the difference is between those who are not in government and are critical of Rouhani not keeping up the promises he made at the time of his election, people who are, if you like, outside the government and keep a critical view of the uh, government. And then we have those who are in closer to the government. Amongst the conservatives, we have those who are, if you like, pretend to be very conservative Islamists, but we know from the way they spend their money or the, the way they accumulate wealth that they're actually more, um, it now become a good um, cover for supporting their political power within the ruling circles. Mm -hmm. right? Having said that, the current threat, the new sanctions, has made the two factions of the regime closer to each other because they need, on the one hand, they expose each other's corruption or problems, but on the other hand, they realize their survival depends on a level of unity, political unity. Um, I see. So it is quite a complicated uh, uh, <laughs> uh, puzzle, uh, so to say. And and one of these more recent developments uh, in Iranian society is that um, Iran has uh, dealt with uh, lots of blowing uh, sanctions uh, against society for many years. And those sanctions were lifted uh, a while back uh, because of the U.S.-Iranian deal. Um, now Trump is going back on that, so that, uh, about that in a minute. But how did the uh, Iranian society develop um, when the sanctions were lifted, and especially with the working class uh, in particular? So the sanctions were, uh, the deal was between Iran and the power five plus one, which are five nuclear powers plus one, which includes the US, mm. right? So Germany was the plus one, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, the way there was jubilations. There was genuine happiness in the street uh, because obviously the previous sanctions had created poverty, unemployment, high prices, inflation going up every day, and so on. What happened um, with ordinary people was there were more jobs, there is no doubt, because firms started returning to Iran, oil was selling, and so on. Ha having said that, even in this two and a half years of what I would call economic uh, improvement, because the EU, the European Union in particular, got involved economically in Iran. Work, we, you had every week workers complaining about non-payment of wages, capitalists putting their money in investment rather than paying them, uh, some capitalists using that, if you like, that gap, that free, relative freedom to put their money out some people put their money in um, high interest deposit accounts and close their factory or close their workshop mm. because it was more financially beneficial. It was short termism because um, now we know there, is, there are more problems with that. But the whole banking sector had a boom from this type of conversion of what I would call industrial capital or workshop capitals or factories into deposit accounts. Right, into finance, into finance capital, or into economic ventures that were high risk. Mm. But the whole of Iran economy has always been short termist because there is always fear of two years time, three years time. But so on the whole, yes, the working class and ordinary people had some prosperity, but the real prosperity was for uh, those in power. Mm. In the same way that during sanctions, it was the poor who suffered, it was the working class who suffered. While if you were in the government, if you were close to the pow circles of power, you could uh, buy the US dollar at a high rate, 
uh, at a low rate, sorry, mm. and use it to um, invest or buy whatever, and everybody else, uh, and then sell it on the black market. Mm. So those in power became very rich during sanctions. And those in, <laughs> so both periods, it was really bad for the working class mm. and the poor. Yeah, that is um, uh, an argument I hear sometimes also in left, uh, uh, left-wing circles, or may well, soft left circles that sanctions uh, help uh, in a way to uh, 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 well uh, create a more just uh, world um, but we really just see um, uh, existing power relationships being entrenched uh, and, and well I should just explain during the sanctions but also after the sanctions uh, we see the same shit repeating all over again and again um, Okay, so now the sanctions are lifted. Uh, well, uh, Trump is now uh, going back on that. Um, yeah, doesn't uh, uh, want to continue the uh, Iran uh, deal. Um, so what does that mean um, internally? But also uh, there is a tension building up between uh, in the triangle America, Iran, Europe. So what could you tell us about that? Okay, so the European Union don't want to move out of the deal. In fact, I think legally, if you've signed an international deal only in late 2015, early to, uh, which actually came into reality Mm -hmm. 2016, you can't just walk out of it and the EU is staying in it and the US is unilaterally walking out. But the European Union is saying they they have reissued uh, legislations that tells European firms they have to continue dealing with countries that the European Union wants to continue to deal with, including Iran, right? So they're not making a special case of Iran. They're saying we will penalize firms that do not want to deal with the countries that the EU hasn't got sanctions against. The US is saying we will penalize financially the the firms that do work with Iran. And that has created a conflict, inevitably. And as you know, that we have already got tariff wars, trade wa- talks of trade wars, maybe not real trade wars, but possibility of trade wars. And that has created additional conflict between uh, EU and the United States. The question remains how the firms will react to this. And my understanding is that European firms are going to think that Uh, the financial penalties put by by the United States, not just the financial penalties, but also losing uh, access to U.S. markets is too much of a financial risk and will ignore the EU legislation. Mm -hmm. What the EU is telling some firms, and I'm not sure how many of them, but some firms are being told Mm -hmm. that the European Investment Bank has allocated a budget to cover Mm. the penalties. (laughs) So we are in a very complicated situation. I still think uh, the Total was involved in a major exploration uh, uh, plan in the south of Iran. They walked out of it completely. So if companies like Total, big companies that have interest in US, but also in the Middle East and are actually European firms, takes that position that losing the U.S., which is obviously a much more important economic factor than Iran, is not worth taking the risk. Iran will face very serious sanctions, secondary in terms of European Union, but still sanctions. I see. And and how is it also creating new uh, tensions within Iranian society? I mean, looking at the ruling elite, looking at the working class? Okay. So the ruling elite, um, there is obviously all this possibility of sanctions had created um, a a situation where people were rushing their money out of the country. So since Trump's election, (laughs) there's been a run on the currency. The reserves are not that high. And the country was just beginning to get out of terrible economic situation. It's now preparing itself to go to a very bad economic situation. The tensions amongst the ruling circles is that uh, obviously everyone is now aware that there is serious corruption, so they're exposing each other's corruption. (laughs) So the one faction says it was all this 
faction sport and so on. It's, it's not very different from Europe. But uh, the, for ordinary people, the prospects are very bad because the jobs that were beginning to be reinstated, say in car manufacture, say in the large industries around car manufacture, because car manufacture creates a, its own side industries, all of that is likely to go. Uh, that's the first round of uh, Trump's uh, sanctions. Mm. Right? The first round, which started in May, was to do with companies making deals with Iran. The second round, starting in November, will deal with sale of Iranian oil. And then we really are looking at very dark situation. Because once a country like Iran, which is a single product, company, uh, country, stops selling its oil, income will plummet. Mm. And that's something that, um, of course, the Iranian government is trying to compensate by selling to China, maybe to some other places that China has influence <laughs> in, and so on. Uh, the European Union is not happy about this, because for the European Union, it's not just the current conflict in terms of trade with US. The European Union sees itself as a competitor to China. And China is now going to get this cheap oil. So long term, cheaper oil, right? Because inevitably Iran will have to sell at a lower price. Mm. So inevitably there are tensions there as well. And that's why the, it's very difficult to know what will happen. But we know that if the November sanctions start, and it's very likely they will start, the situation will get very bad for ordinary people. Moving the focus a little uh, to more towards the region, um, we could say that there is a, a proxy war going on between Iran, Iran and uh, Saudi Arabia for quite uh, a while now. And one of these uh, flashpoints are, is uh, the civil war in Syria. Um, so now that the civil war is, is, is winding down uh, and Assad is consolidating his power again, um, how is Iran uh, reasserting itself in in the region, well, uh, and especially uh, towards uh, uh, Syria. Okay, you rightly point out to this that the, the civil war in Syria is important to mention. I don't think that the Iranians went out to fight the war in Syria. The, the fact that Iran had become more and more powerful in the region after the fall of Saddam Hussein, mm -hmm. which was its main rival, basically, and the Taliban in Afghanistan, which in religious terms was their other rival, Iran became quite powerful. And it had this long belt that it controlled, uh, Syria, Iran, Lebanon, and some would say the Shias in Afghanistan. So it was a long bit, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the source of the conflict with Saudi Arabia. I think the Saudis uh, and the Gulf states, Persian Gulf states, had financed various offshoots of al-Qaeda, and they were becoming more and more powerful in Syria, and to a certain extent in Lebanon. So the intervention of the Lebanese uh, Hezbollah in fighting this Al-Qaeda offshoots in Lebanon became quite a serious matter. And in fact, the Hezbollah in Lebanon gained a lot of um, votes because it was seen by non-Shia Lebanese, even Christians, as the, fight, the, the groups that fought Al-Qaeda and ISIS, uh, beginning of ISIS in Lebanon. And that led Iran into the Syrian war. Uh, Alevis are not Shias. The, the ruling circles uh, like Assad and his family are Alevis. And strictly speaking, for the Shia clergy in Iran, they are heretics. Right? But it was a pragmatic decision to defend that because they were thinking that if we don't do that, ISIS will move further east. It had already got some parts of Iraq by that stage. Mm -hmm. yeah? So it would get really close to the borders of Iran. And that's why Iranians got involved in Syria. You are right. Now that the situation is winding down, there is a competition between the... Even amongst the victors, there is a competition. So every now and then, the Iranian papers say, oh, Assad is making deals with Russia and it's selling Iran out of the deal. Mm. Right? So it happens quite a lot. You hear, read about it. And especially some of the conservative papers say that Rouhani isn't doing enough. That's why there's these deals going on. 
it's quite clear that Iran will, make, will not make much financial benefits, will not have much financial. It's already in economic problems internally. How can it benefit from Syria? But I think politically, Iran is keen to maintain some form of military presence in Syria because for the Iranian government, that's insurance. They're thinking that if sanctions don't work, the US and Israel will use Israel to bomb Iran, or at least bomb Iran's nuclear uh, industry. In such circumstances, it will be uh, the Iran's only defense, because Iran can't go and fight the US or Israel. <laughs> it's Iran's only defense will be Hezbollah and whatever it has in terms of revolutionary guards in Syria to attack Israel. So from that point of view, they are, I, as far as I know, they are looking at keeping a military presence in Syria, mm -hmm. while Israel is doing the exact opposite. Israel wants this <coughs> buffer zone, as you know, between the border of Syria with Israel and Iran, and um, where the Iranian troops are. The Golan Heights, you mean? Well, yeah, but, but it also wants Iran to move further away from that. So I'm not sure the kilometer numbers, but you know, there is all these talks that the U.S. position and Israel's official position is Iran has to leave Syria altogether. Um, well, before returning to Israel, <laughs> um, there is, is also quite a sizable po uh, Kurdish population, both in Iran and Syria. So now that um, the war is uh, winding down, what would that mean for Rojava or actually the Kurdish population in Iran itself? Okay, the Kurdish population in Iran is slightly, because of the mountains, the way geographically things are, are closer to Iraqi Kurds. The borders are more uh, open between the two and the family connections are more. Having said that, Iranian Kurds follow very carefully what's going on in Iraq and in Syria and Kurdistan because they see themselves as one nation, right? What has happened with the YPG and uh, Rohoa is that um, they managed to defend and defeat um, IS, but they also accepted US air raids as part of this situation. And as a result of this, um, there was, I think there was a conflict because the Turkish government got involved. A larger section, another section of the Kurdish population lives in uh, Turkey and Turkey is very keen to defeat the PKK or weaken the PKK, which is the sister organization. As a result of all this, Turkey has now moved in to the Syrian Kurdish areas with very terrible consequences for the Kurdish people because it obviously is uh, re retracting any independence or any autonomy they had gained during this period. I understand that the Turkish forces are extremely brutal in those areas. Mm -hmm. So Iranians are very wary of the dangers that Kurdish uh, region, regional autonomy creates. Um, but on the other hand, uh, the leadership of the Kurdish groups in Iran are, I would say, as corrupt as the leadership of the Kurdish autonomy government in Iraq. And they are seeking for themselves to create an, an independent Kurdistan, maybe with the help of Trump. And unfortunately, they are. I would say, I don't want to use a rude word, but they're not using their brain cells very well <laughs> because anyone would say that this is a very dangerous, risky and a very bad decision. Afgelopen week plaatsen we een oproep op Facebook om ons Soundcloud doel te bereiken. Nou, dat hebben we zeker bereikt. Van 15 euro per maand zitten we op het moment van opnemen op 45 euro per maand en is ons volgende doel, publicatie op Spotify, nog maar 11 euro verwijderd. Veel dank aan de nieuwe donateurs, Roberto en Dennis voor 2,50 euro, Frank voor 5 euro en Bob en Sam voor maar liefst 10 euro. Wauw! We kregen trouwens de hartelijke groeten in de laatste aflevering van Klassen gekletst en laat ik maar meteen van de gelegenheid gebruik maken om luisteraars te wijzen op het feit dat er een nieuwe aflevering van hun is. Lijkt het jou dus wat om een bijna een uur te luisteren naar borrelpraat van kameraden uit Nijmegen? Ga naar facebook.com slash klassengeklets of soundcloud.com slash klassengeklets. Wij gaan in ieder geval de komende maand sowieso weer op Soundcloud komen. 
En wil je ons ook horen op Spotify? Je hebt nog een paar uur te gaan als je ons uh, voor oktober wilt helpen. En anders worden het in november. En hè Bob? Wakker blijven hè? Ja, er is nog een stuk interview. Um, uh, well, I'm also, also asking about uh, Royava, um, as there's a lot of romanticizing on the left, maybe uh, regarding it. What are your What are your views about this uh, left wing commune of of sorts, uh, and and the its alternative on building a uh, capitalist society? Okay, so I was in Iranian Kurdistan a couple of decades ago when we were doing the same. And um, we weren't building a commune, but we were. We were revolutionary organizations. We were working with the peasants there and so on. It's romantic, but not politically useful, in my opinion. There are various reasons. First of all, you are surrounded by this complicated political situation. Iran, Saudi Arabia, Syria the Americans intervening, the Turkish forces coming, the British and the Americans doing air raids, right? So you can't have socialism in a tiny piece when you are surrounded by all of these forces. And then, unfortunately for Kurds throughout history, not just in Syria now, but in Turkey, in Iran, in Iraq, you end up accepting support for the enemy of your enemy. And then you're part of this complicated equation between the fighting governments and their bosses and their supporters in superpowers, right? In the old days, it was the United States and the Soviet Union. Now it's the United States that dominates that. So as soon as you accept uh, air rates for your defense or money for your existence from the United States, Turkish troops think, well, we are part of NATO. We can go in now. Right. And and it and then the Americans think, oh well, are we gonna spend any effort trying to deter the Turks going in? No. What's why should we? And they just move out. And that's the current situation. So the current situation is in Rahawa people feel betrayed. But mm. I think some of us would have predicted that this would happen. And yes, they did very well. I'm not denying the fact that it's good to have that experience, but you have to see it as a, if you like, a, um, like a laboratory. You're doing something for a short time. You realize it's short term, it won't last. And political leaders in those situations then have to think really hard about the kind of alliances they make. Mm -hmm. I remember very well warning um, um, Iran uh, in a debate with uh, uh, an Iranian Kurdish comrade that you start accepting a small bit of help, aid, and you're submerged as a dependent of a superpower before you knew it. Mm. And for Iranian Kurds, this happened by becoming, by accepting a bit of aid from Saddam Hussein and then losing it all together, you know, becoming part of his attacks against Iran. And um, then the more decent ones remove themselves from that situation. But you can't do it nowadays. Well, uh, you mentioned uh, Saddam Hu uh, Hussein. Um, so focusing a bit more on uh, Iraq, uh, we saw the uh, well paradoxical situation happening that after uh, the uh, American invasion of Iraq, uh, we saw that uh, eventually Iran was consolidating its power in, in Iraq. Um, so how is the situation there over there now? Because uh, is it still in a state of civil war? Uh, what is happening? Okay, so if you like the succession of what I started calling occupation government, because really at the initial stages there was, if you remember, the United States uh, State Department had a governor for Iraq or a, a practical ruler. And then there was a, a, a nominated uh, Iraqi Shia close to Iran, but also part of the US <laughs> government, new government. And what they did was year zero, you remember that Iraq had, a, so the debasification made unhappy, a large section of the population, mainly Sunni population, 
but also the Sunnis in the countryside, in the towns that were Sunni dominated, felt completely left out of the politics of Baghdad, where mm-hmm. these nominated or um, council nominated Shia leaders, sectarian very often, took power. Mm-hmm. And that led, in my opinion, that made a large contribution to the way Iraqis who weren't necessarily pro-Saudi accepted Saudi funds Mm -hmm. and then got involved with all sorts of Al-Qaeda, Al-Baghdadi groups and then the final version of it, the horrible Islamic State. Mm -hmm. Most of the territory has been won as far as I can gather, if not all. And the way this has been won is mainly through uh, the um, um, Shia groups, the Shia militia, what is called the Shia militia, sometimes Iranian troops, but mainly the Shia militia in Iraq. The dissatisfaction in the Sunni cities remain. I don't think the Sunni cities have now come to love the central government. The recent elections had two victors. Some Sunnis got elected. I think it was in June or May, but recent last election. So after a succession of pro-Iranian governments, the last one, which I think is the Abadi government, wasn't, um, w- had some contradictions with Iran, but anyway, they've lost now. So two Shia groups are now the winners of the current election. They are uh, Murtada al sadrs group in Basra, who has some differences with Iran and has created a coalition of, with secular forces, including the former Iraqi, well, the current or the whatever, the Iraqi Communist Party, but it's a very soft uh, coalition. But in, in, at the end of the day, A, he's Shia, and B, at the end of the day, he's pro-Iran. He's pro- and Amiri, who is another guy who's close to Iran. So the two, and, they, and the opposition went to court to challenge the election, but the election, the election, uh, they won the election and they won the court case. So this week, the court case, last week, the court case finished and now they are in power. They are, they are preparing for power. So basically, we will have another Shia coalition government in Baghdad with some Sunnis as opposition in the parliament. Uh, the state is supposed to have a Kurdish president, Talibani was that, if you, uh, according to this new constitution, but as you know, he died, he was very ill for a long time and died. I think the Sunnis might be happier with this uh, Muqtad Assad coalition, but the difficulty in Iraq, as in many other parts of the Middle East, is that the victor is always ven- wants vengeance. So, the fear is that the Shia militias will attack, will continue being repressive in Sunni areas, where it would obviously give rise to new forms of uh, Salafi groups like Islamic State. Uh, hopefully that won't happen. Hopefully they've learned the lessons that this type of sectarianism gives rise to its opponents in that line. But I don't know enough to be able to guarantee that that's the case. Um, all right, so continuing uh, on our tour <laughs> on the peninsula, um, uh, there's, there's also now a, a war going on in Yemen, of course, uh, for quite a few years already. And uh, we, there we see Saudi, Saudi Arabia uh, consolidating its power. Um, how, how is, is the Iranian-Saudi conflict going over there uh, as a proxy war, probably? It, that is definitely a proxy war. I mean, it's that all the signs of a proxy war. So Iranians support the houses, and they are not Shia, but they are different from the Salafi Sunnis of uh, um, the previous government. So it's quite complicated because this was a civil war, and there has been a, almost a continuation of civil war in Yemen for the last decades. You know, first there was the north-south divide with. Uh, the Democratic Republic of Yemen in the south, then the north was more pro-US, pro-Western. There are tribal differences. There is the Sunni Shia, the Sunni Houthi, not Shia differences. There are also other minorities in the Yemen territory. Iran is supporting the Houthis, again, in my opinion, in a very 
um, opportunistic, pragmatic ways. There isn't, it's not as simple as that it's a Shia Sin, Sunni conflict, right? It's even less of a Shin, Sunni Shia conflict than Syria. Well, I explained Syria wasn't that either. It's more Iran wanting uh, a foothold on the other side of the Persian Gulf for strategic reasons, but also to warn Saudi Arabia, if you bomb us, if you become a base for the US, because Iran remembers that Saudi Arabia was the base for attacking Saddam. Mm. So if there is a war, I mean, people look at you know, next five years, they think there might be a war, or 10 years, there might be a war. Then they want to have allies on the other side of the Persian Gulf who can attack Saudi Arabia, a bit in the way they want people to be able to attack Israel. So the Iranian intentions there are mainly to do with that. And um, I think they have been he helping the Houses, there's no doubt. But also there is a lot of exaggeration by both Saudi Arabia and especially the US uh, uh, representative in UN, Nikki Haley, keeps showing these weapons. They took a whole, almost a crater size um, pipe to the UN offices, which must have cost a bit to take there, whether by ship or whatever, uh, that said made in Iran to prove that Iran was involved. I don't think Iranians are stupid enough to deny <laughs> they are involved. You don't need to. But also, I don't think they're stupid enough to send weapons that says made in Iran. <laughs> I mean, I think it really is a bit uh, much. But it's interesting because people see poverty in Iran. They are under a lot of pressure. And I think Iran's interventions across the region are unpopular in the country, not because people are, mm, mm, if you like, are ignorant of what's going on. It's partly because they think the economic situation is so bad, why are we investing any money in these operations? Yeah. And so you do hear in some of the protests, you do hear people saying, leave Yemen alone or leave Syria alone, deal with our problems, um, which is, I think, inevitable. The government's answer is, we need these because otherwise they will get rid of us. Hmm. Um, all right, so we are running a bit out of time, so I'll uh, just finish uh, with the um, excursion. <laughs> um, uh, so we haven't seen all the intricacies, of course, in the uh, on on uh, in the, all, all of these conflicts, but I want to end with with Israel, um, and uh, we see that Israel for the last few years have been uh, positioning itself for a protracted war with Iran, um, albeit mainly also for internal political reasons, just to have a good excuse to expel the Palestinians from their borders. Um, how likely do you, how realistically do you think a war will be happening in the coming period um, here? I think Israelis are very keen um, to expand their territory to the extreme. And I think they're looking for excuses. So when, for example, Trump says things like uh, Hamas is supported by Iran, this is part of this whole idea that then Israel can attack Gaza, where not everyone is a supporter of Hamas by any means. And in fact, many people tell me that the long-term uh, uh, power of Hamas has made people opposed to it. So even those who voted maybe earlier for Hamas now see some of them as exiles who are enjoying life in the uh, Persian Gulf while the people suffer in Gaza. Some of them don't like the Hamas methods. Some, so, but the ambition is to keep saying, oh, well, this is this existentialist threat that uh, uh, Iran, Hamas, terrorism, and so on, and launch a war. Now, if, for example, there was a military operation against Iran and Hezbollah attacked Israel, which is part of the scenario some people like Netanyahu are considering, then it's a good excuse to attack the Palestinians. Mm -hmm. Because the Israelis know that defeating Hezbollah is very difficult, but attacking Palestinians is easy. Right? So that will be the way things will evolve. 
just on the Hamas-Iran thing, Hamas and Iran are not allies. They've actually had exchanged strong word of war, war of words. On Syria, they were on two different sides. On Iraq, they were on different sides. Hamas and Iran have had relations, have had negotiations, but Hamas is much closer to Saudi Arabia or the Qatar, the Qatar government or the Gulf states, not currently Saudi Arabia, but historically Saudi Arabia, mm. than it is to Shia Iran. I see. So uh, perhaps concluding on a um, perspective. Um, so, uh, for example, Moshe Machover uh, has been uh, uh, making propaganda for uh, for decades now to to have a resolution on a more uh, international working class uh, basis and on the peninsula uh, what is what is your view on that given also the uh, uh, current state of the left well despite the current state of the left i still think that is a vision that is worth investigating no single country, no single nationality, Kurds, Palestinians, Turks in Iran, Turkmen's in Iraq, will be able to get anywhere if they try and limit the, the horizon of their views about a level of independence, not just from the states that are currently repressing them, but from the presence of the US and Israel and the state of the region. If they want to liberate themselves from that, a coalition of the a united effort by these nationalities is necessary. And that is the only possibility of finding peace in Israel, peace in Syria, peace in Iraq, where the working class forces unite not on the basis of nationality, while maintaining some level of autonomy for their regions, but they unite on the basis of much higher principles, equality freedom right so is there something you want to plug uh, so should people uh, uh, want to search out uh, more okay i th think uh, we are at a stage where we have to restart thinking of hands off people of iran a campaign we did against war and sanctions but also against iran's islamic republic in support of iranian working class mm -hmm. who are not who are struggling now so we are in the verge of starting that hopoi.org is the website and uh, we update it regularly with news and analysis about the, uh, mainly analysis about the region. But it would be good if we had, uh, I now, I'm now talking to comrades in the United States who are very keen to start US hope, Hands of People of Iran. And uh, it would be very good if we had a European side to it as well. Thank you for your time and uh, have a nice uh, school still. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks a lot.